Thanks very much, Mia, for the introduction. And hello and welcome to everybody who has joined us. It's nice to see so much support. Um, my name is Lee Lydie. Um, I have just been at Strauss for a year as a cataloger and a researcher. And I have been one of the curators of this particular exhibition and part of the webinar series, along with my colleagues, Mia Bowman, Wilhelm van Riesensburg, and Kate Fellens. Um, so I want to, before I introduce the panelists, uh, give some context a little bit to why we are having this webinar series. If you haven't already joined us for one of the webinar series before or um, have been watching, you, you might already know, but this is a series discussing in various ways different themes that our exhibition which will open on Monday, the 14th, giving direction, figuration, past and present at Valkamiant Manor Gardens in Cape Town uh, over the Cape Town Art Fair deals with. So um, it's a non-commercial exhibition and it's open nine to 4 p.m. There's free entrance. So I hope you do come and see some of the works we discuss today. Uh, the webinar series is really an opportunity to open up the discussions that the works in the show um, allude to, and this is an opportunity to really have conversations that we've been wanting to have for a long time, and we have internally at Strauss, but we're opening it up to our plat to public platforms. In thinking about the theme of this exhibition, figuration, past and present, we approached it with extreme caution, actually. And this quote, which you see on the screen, um, I was actually made aware of it by um, a fellow writer in Hopalé Molloy, who's written the forward for our catalog and also gave me great tips and insights when I approached her with this project and ways of exhibiting this particular theme. It really epitomizes what I mean by this extreme caution. So I'll read it here. It says critical engagement with gendered and racialized exhibitions is needed, as we believe that if such exhibitions are produced uncritically, they can sometimes show a failure to recognize violence. Violence that artists themselves often call out in their work in direct or codified ways and the violence that curatorial framework can sometimes inadvertently demonstrate. This is a quote taken from a very interesting journal article, very worth reading by the two talking yonis, otherwise known as Reshma Chiba and Nontobeko Nontobela. And I am attracted to this quote as a way to summarize what the exhibition means for me, because just as the same as gender or racialized exhibitions need to be critically engaged, the concept of figurative African art needs to be seriously unpacked by the global art industry. And if we box artists into categories too readily in our attempt to promote them, then we can risk a disservice. And just as Africa is not a country, and neither are the artists within the now 54 countries, and the thousands and thousands of diverse cultures that exist all the same. Artists should be seen as individuals with individual creativity. And so for us, this theme of the figure in art in our exhibition is certainly not a survey, but rather examples of art used to unpack and challenge what figurative Afri African art really is. So here are some examples of some of the themes. One of the themes that we undertook to explore and critically engage with is the concept of the gaze or the canon of the gaze. And really essentially we're asking questions by showing various different artists interpretations of this. Who is looking at who? And how do bodies translate from certain perspectives? How are contemporary artists challenging this notion are some of the questions we want to ask. Another theme is the influence of historical. History and tradition on the continent is hugely diverse. And it does influence many African artists today who 
are usually using it to challenge universal status quo. And this is a really interesting conversation between past and present happening at the moment. And finally, Africa is not an island. Artists take reference from each other across continents from the past and references from all around the world. For example, modernism exists within Africa as much as it did in Europe and the West, but was always interpreted by the artists who explored it as a theme on their own individual terms and influences. So there are many artists represented in this way here. So you can see just from the range of examples on the show, just how diverse the range of figuration can be. And there's only 71 artworks on our exhibition. The panelists on this talk are here to further substantiate this diversity and individuality and explore the figure in different ways. And so I, I welcome and Thank you for joining us. And I'd like to briefly introduce each of you. Um, Ayobola Kakira Okun from Nigeria is a contemporary visual artist and lecturer at the Department of Creative Arts, University of Lagos. Welcome and thank you. Helen Teed is Zimbabwean's contemporary visual artist and finalist of the Sovereign African Art Prize being announced next week. Teresa Kutala Famino is a South African multimedia artist working in paint, photography, and performance. Thank you very much for joining us. And finally, Valerie Cabal, First Fall Gallery, um, head of First Fall Gallery at Harari and sponsor of the Emerging Painting Invitational Prize, EPI, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. Thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm going to start um, with no particular preference, just alphabetical order, to be fair, um, with you, Ayobola. Um, first of all, welcome. If you could turn on your video and um, your speaker. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Thank yes, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for being on our talk. Oh, excellent. I guess I'd like to start by asking you what artist or artwork, because you've had a squiz at the catalogue, so um, what artist or artwork in the exhibition you find inspiring or even challenging and why? Um, I, it was really tough, it was a tough choice. I mean, there was so much amazing work in there, but I have two definite favorites. Um, the first is definitely Ben Emo. Um, I mean, I'm not exactly impartial. I am Nigerian too, but um, he's always, I don't think there's any like <laughs> young Nigerian artist who went to art school who would not cite him as like a personal inspiration in some form. Um, I remember in high school, cause I took fine art throughout high school. There was never a year when we we're exploring like indigenous Nigerian artists who, when we did not explore something about Ben and Wong's work. Um, and I've always found his work just visually striking, almost lyrical, really, almost musical um, in the way he approaches forms, very fluid, um, almost like he's dancing in a way, but from stories I hear, he doesn't strike me as a very fanciful person. So I've always enjoyed that juxtaposition between, you know, the person and the art. Um, so Ben and Ramu is definitely a no-brainer. Um, and then I am quite obsessed with that, uh, Kanisa's work. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I yes, you're fine. I love the work so much. Um, I had the chance to see the solo at Stevenson. I think it was 2019. It was before COVID. Uh, yeah, so 2019 maybe or 2020. Um, and it's just so playful. It's playful. It's the perfect amount of rye. Um, I like the approach to just the making of the work, the physicality of the work, almost like they're creating like a slightly messed up puzzle only they understand and they're doing their best to like let us in on the secret a little bit. Um, so I quite enjoy that playfulness um, just mentally and physically with what the work looks like. So hands down those two are my top two. It's certainly an exquisite work to see in the flesh. A photograph does not do justice. It doesn't do it justice. It does not do it justice. We hung it today and it's just quite out of this world, I agree. 
Beautiful. I think the next step to ask you and the next question is if you could explain why or how you use the figure in your work. I hope I explain this well. It's a bit weird vocalizing it, but um, <laughs> for me, the figure is like a, it's like a grounding device. A lot of my work is very, very dreamy, you know, very fantastical and fanciful. Um, especially with my recent body of work, um, I started it again in lockdown. Thank you, 2020. Um, in the middle of hard lockdown, um, and it was the result of years of just working on myself and realizing that I didn't have a lot of childhood memories thanks to childhood trauma. And there's something very disquieting about realizing you don't really have an origin story. It's like starting a movie halfway in with no context. Um, but I decided to make that a plus. Um, I decided if I could not remember my origin story, I was just gonna recreate one. And in recreating one, give myself the freedom to let it be whatever I want it to be. I mean, if I decide that I was fighting unicorns when I was five, you went there so you can't contradict me. And so because a lot of my work is quite dreamy and has always been a way for me to exist in my head and out of my body, um, by using the physicality of the body, it's a way to stay grounded in reality and just remind myself um, that it's still avatars of the self. And by making avatars of the self, I'm sort of making extensions of other people who find meaning in what I do. Um, yeah, so for me, it's about, it's, you know, it's like a small smack on the wrist, like a gentle one. <laughs> And you have to tell us how you produce your work. It's so interesting how you use medium. Uh, it's, it, it's funny, I started working with paper entirely by mistake, um, but I love it, I love it. I feel like it's the perfect Trojan horse as a material. I feel like because it's so familiar and known, people tend to underestimate what the material can do. And so in working with paper the way I do, I try to hold, I, I, I hope people will reconsider what they think they know and how they think they know it. Um, and I also just really enjoy working with lines. I feel like lines are almost like a virus, but in a really good way, you know, it's not alive, it's not dead. It can be many things at once. And there's a lot of room to maneuver and to interpret. Um, and so I just quite enjoy mar marrying the two. Um, and kind of seeing where that takes me. Um, and it's just also like a really meditative process because it's so repetitive and it's so labor intensive and every single strip has to pass through human hands. Um, nothing happens by mistake. Everything is quite planned and ordered. Um, yeah. It's beautiful work. And I'd love Thank you to tell us where you see your next artistic project taking you. Um, I see my work becoming more aggressively three-dimensional. Um, I see, I see um, the possibility of my work entering like the installation space, like in a more deliberate way. Um, because right now I think of my work as lines on steroids. And even just that idea, <laughs> even just that idea has a lot of possibilities that could pan out, but ideas always outstrip my pace. So I've learned to be quite patient in that regard. Um, but definitely in the next few years, I see that panning out. Wow. It's amazing to see and thank you for sharing with us and thank you for being open to this panel. We'll get back to you later at the end, but thank you so thank much you. for a brief introduction to you and your work. Um, thank you. And going on to our next panelist, um, Helen Teed. Can you unmute and make yourself um, Hi. seen? Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Gosh, it's a bit frightening seeing my face looking back at me. <laughs> uh, Don't be frightened. It's just a fun chat. Thanks for <laughs> joining us. So I think to start the same question, really, what artist or artwork in the exhibition did you find inspiring or challenging and, and, and why did you gravitate towards it? Um, I think the work that I, well, 
the work I found more most interesting because I've only seen the catalog obviously are I think I'm influenced because of, I've seen them before um, so I can kind of have an idea of how they actually are um, but also the works that kind of um, aren't necessarily exploring the figure per se but um, using the figure as a way of exploring something else or you know or not even using the figure that the figure is just that whatever comes through um so like uh um nandifa's tambo's um kind of um skin uh th this is a print but i've seen her uh, installation sculptural works and yeah it's it's more for me the materiality and that the figure gives it some kind of form, sculptural form. But I, I this like when you walk into when I, I remember walking into that installation and the smell and the kind of taste of this the skin was kind of pervading the room. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting in that sense. Um, and then um, like Jackson Klungwani and um, Portia Zvavahera's works, they kind of uh, like there's the figure, but it's more about talking about something more like, I mean, I remember walking into Jackson's exhibition. I went to Jackson's exhibition in, at the Norval Foundation and it was really a spiritual experience. Um, and again, like it was more the feeling that he created with this materiality of the wood and using the figure to kind of tell a story of something else, but um, yeah, in a sort of oblique way. Um, and Portia kind of does the same with these sort of dreamscapes paintings. And then uh, another painting I really, really loved is um, Georgina Gratrix's, because she, I think she just like really uses paint in a fleshy way. Um, so it kind of makes sense that figures would come through because it's really like an exploration of flesh. So it's more, I don't know, I, it's more the materiality than the, the I mean, it's they're, they're paintings and sculptures, then I, I don't know about, yeah, them being figurative or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Once again, looking at the work for um, how it's explored by medium, you can tell that you are definitely an artist that takes um, your medium very seriously. <laughs> And you can see that in your work that uh, we have a few examples. And I think this is a good opportunity to explain why or how, or even if you do use the figure in your work. I know some of these are titled figure and tree, for example, and that sort of thing. Um, but you've taken the concept of figure to an opposite extreme in a way. So please tell us more about how you're using the figure or not using the figure. <laughs> I mean, I think it kind of just comes through because of drawing. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of time drawing and then those, the lines that, that happen or whatever, the drawing that happens kind of echoes through in the paintings. Um, and I draw people a lot, and, but I also draw other things a lot. Um, it's just that I think being human, we recognize ourselves um, or, our, or faces or whatever, like, we're, we're kind of centered on, on, on how we are, <laughs> that um, you recognize first the figure and you pick up, pick up on that first. Um, when, I mean, in the world in general, there's so much more going on. Uh, it's not, you know, just our, us as figures going around. There's, you know, we're a tiny part of this whole diverse world of different figures and abstractions and so on and so forth. So it's not really, um, yeah, it's not really about figuration, I guess. It's more about storytelling and create and kind of expressing some kind of emotional feeling or uh, worry or, or, or fear or something like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway. <laughs> it certainly does, and it's really an interesting take on storytelling. Uh, your work is very emotive um, and moving. Um, and I think I need to ask you where you think your next artistic project will take you. Um, um, I literally don't even know what's going to happen. Like, 
when I walk into the studio in the morning. <laughs> so um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I just, I'm just continuing working really. And uh, I don't know, it's the great thing about paint is that you, you never really, it's always showing you something new. So uh, I don't really have plans. It's not really a thing that I plan. It's more a response to past things, I guess. Yeah, so not a very um, clear answer, but <laughs> there we go. Well, at least it is definitely producing more work, which we'd love to see from you. So <laughs> congratulations yes. on beautiful work. And I look forward to hearing about next week in the Sovereign Art Prize. How it will be there um, to see your work in the flesh. And uh, thank you very much. I will be back to you at the end of this. Thanks, Thanks for all. So the next uh, panelist is uh, Teresa Cotella Firmino, um, if you can unmute yourself and show your video. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay, thank you, finally. <laughs> yes, Teresa had some trouble with load shedding and having to find a space where charges will work and Wi-Fi will work. Thank you very much for the great efforts to come and be here with us. Um, and nice to see your face. Um, I think we need to start in the same way and talk about the okay. artists that you chose as your favorite from the catalog um, and why you find them inspiring or challenging or both um, and how they influence you as an artist. Um, I think the two artists that I was looking at is uh, Syrian Shilako and I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, and Eddie, I don't know if it's uh, Lunga or Ilunga, I'm not sure. Um, Ilunga. <laughs> Ilunga, yes. Um, I think because, uh, and mostly I think what attracted me to the, yes, artworks are very beautiful and very inspiring, but also the titles, because I've been battling with these questions in my work as well. So with Syrian, it's about um, ancestors. Uh, I've been looking at this idea of, you know, I've, my work has always been about um, me looking at the past and my family and my parents but then when it come uh, speaking about ancestors uh, goes more into like a spiritual level rather than just like history um, and I've been battling to to engage my family when it comes to that uh, because they are very like very catholic very christian so for them like african spirituality is not um, it's, they see it as taboo in the family um, and I've been looking at uh, Eddie's, um, Eddie's work uh, in terms of, I think I see the work as very like uh, Afri uh, futuristic. I don't wanna call it Afrofuturism because it's just the future. There's no such thing as African futurism uh, for me. Uh, so it's just like, you know, um, the future for me. And I think I'm very interested in these two works because um, lately I've been thinking about, um, um, I can even say like DNA, uh, and inherited trauma and genetics. Um, I think uh, I just recently gave birth and I had like a very difficult birth um, and the doctors couldn't explain to me why it happened. And then someone like, you know, after doing some re research, they said it's because of the trauma in your genes. So I've been delving into that. Like, you know, it's something that I can't, um, it's something, there was nothing I could do to prevent what happened to me and to my baby. Uh, and I'm, instead of just engaging with the history of my family, uh, which is like the civil war and colonialism and slavery, I'm trying to look deeper, like underneath the skin. Um, even the skin is an organ itself and trying to unpack my family through that as well. Um, yeah, so I think that's why I was looking at those two artists, you know, who are my ancestors? Um, what happened to them that I now have... Uh, inherited this uh, DNA or these genetics and what will my future generation look like and what will they inherit? What will I add to the genes? Um, so yeah, those, that's why uh, those two works inspire me. Uh, and I'm definitely gonna look more into their works uh, so I can do more research, yeah. I think it's really interesting as well. There is this concept or um, assumption, I would say, 
that artists are only starting to engage with their histories from the continent now. But mm -hmm. um, the, these artists, particularly Cyprian Shalakwe, this mm. was produced in 1970 and just like Jackson Trombani um, exploring ancestry in the 80s, this has actually been a, a, a long conversation mm. and a long trauma mm. and a discussion to discuss. So it's interesting that you're taking this on and looking at artwork from the past and bringing it into the present, which is mm. really um, what we're trying to do with the exhibition as well. This work actually, I have to say, is uh, beautiful. And on the show, we hung it today and one of your works. Um, but I would like, you have talked a little bit about it already, but please mm -hmm. can you explain more in terms of your latest work, how you're using the figure in your work and why? Um, I guess the figure for me, I think even before I started painting, you know, my performances, you could say, was like a, a way of me using the figure as well. Um, because I think I, I had this idea that, you know, uh, violence happens to the body. Um, and especially like being a, like a black female who's a foreigner, but not really a foreigner in South Africa. You know, my body is really the point of where I experience um, different forms of trauma and abuse and joy and everything that comes with being a, a foreign black woman in South Africa. Um, but then also my body is also a point of resistance. And it's also a point where I can, um, you know, confront that, that gaze. Um, so, and yeah, so the work is kind of going into that. And also uh, as if, if it's like, if I have to speak about like, as you approach the work, what you see, the type of bodies that I'm working with in my work, like I'm, I'm normal, like the skinny art school student anymore. Like <laughs> I'm now a mother and my body has transformed and I have different marks on my body uh, that speak to the transformation that I'm going through as, uh, through womanhood. But also, as I said uh, previously, looking deeper into the skin, into the DNA, into the atom and understanding myself through that. And then, yeah, and then, and hopefully through that, I'll be able to understand my, my, uh, my ancestors, my history, uh, even my country or the several countries that I come from or that my family comes from. Um, so yeah, so the work is kind of, uh, yeah, so the work is kind of, you know, moving <laughs> into that direction now, um, yeah. And before I ask you the final question, I just have to say um, there will be a performance by Teresa at Welchement engaging with the space itself um, as a site. Um, I don't want to tell anyone about it. I want everybody to come, but there are unfortunately people from all over the world on this webinar. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to discuss a little bit of what we have in store, but if not, there will be footage and we will see the performance happen on the 16th of February. So I do hope people join. It's up to you, Teresa, I know performance is about. <laughs> I, I, can, I can speak a little bit of about the work. I feel, for me, Cape Town is a very interesting city for me um, uh, because I feel like it has changed a lot but hasn't really changed a lot. Um, so for me, as I said, I'm, uh, the body becomes a, a, a point, uh, the body is a point of, where people, you know, the body is where you experience trauma and abuse, but the body can also be used as a form of resistance and a way to confront. So that's what I can say about the performance and about taking space and ownership and all those things that come with um, the politics of uh, Cape Town. That's great. And I'm really looking forward to it. Mm. Um, what's the project? I mean, you have talked about it quite a bit. Do, do you want to share with us any more? Um, about the next artistic project and where it's taking you? Um, I think I've, I kind of spoke about what I um, want to do. Maybe I can say that the, the next title of my show um, is going to be The Owners of the Earth. Um, and now speaking about, uh, as I said, about, you know, genes and uh, motherhood and womanhood and trauma um, and inherited trauma. So, yeah, so that's where my work is going to now. Great, and will that be at Everett Reed? Um, no, uh, the first one is going to be hopefully in, in, in Portugal. I'm still working on that with um, 
in Sofa Gallery, but I am having a show with uh, Everard Reed in August. Okay, great. Well, we wish you all the best with that. And thank you very much for sharing some of some light on your beautiful work. Um, and we'll be back to you at the end of the panel. Uh, last but not least, we have Valerie Kabov. Uh, welcome. If you can open your um, video and unmute. Hi. Hi, uh, hi, Lee. Thanks very much uh, for welcoming me here. Um, Thank yeah. you so much. And um, so I just, feel in, yeah, oh, sorry. I feel disqualified to be speaking. Among oh, no, the not others. at all. <laughs> they are very much so, and you know, with good reason. So, yeah. <laughs> I just want to summarize something just before I ask my question. Well, Helen, Mia, and I haven't really to summarize, we haven't planned. A all encompassing exhibition about contemporary African art and the figure. We've chosen a small aspect of it that, um, that is written about extensively and often in the international press. And one sees plenty of evidence of artists nowadays using it in their practice. Um, we've heard a few comments over the webinar series that I want to address um, on Monday. Uh, Sean asked an interesting question about perhaps the body in African art is over fetishized. And on Wednesday, uh, Olivia Anani did um, raise concerns about how the theme of figuration could pigeonhole contemporary African artists. So we're already thinking about second iterations almost of this exhibition for next year. What about abstraction? What about the idea of conceptualists? Lism in and modern and contemporary art and um, so with all of this in mind I wanted to ask you how do you see figuration playing out in African art and and your concerns about it I mean so first of all I'll do I'll do two things uh, one I'll reflect on the subject and then I'll bring it into context of the project that is happening right now which is the emerging painting invitational um, yes, so please. so uh, so first of all, I think it is important to address uh, address the subject of uh, figuration in any case, uh, because it, of this historical moment. I'm really glad that we're doing this in a context of a panel discussion with artists who are unique voices and also stellar examples of uh, the, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, the right way of doing it, right, who are not who are not. So the current moment in figuration that you refer to, Lee, is one that is driven by the Western gaze, the one that is driven by a market. And, and fortunately, you know, our panelists are three fantastic artists who are singular in their mission and singular in their, you know, honesty and integrity in the way they practice and to themselves rather than rather than refer you know rather than speaking to um to you know to a particular you know moment you know financially rewarding moment shall we say right so and it's really rewarding that there are three women artists and i sort of so i salute you right and i feel very privileged to be on the panel with you. And so I think, you know, I think this says a lot, right? Um, so that's, Thank that's you. one. I think it's also really important to understand that the current historical moment is, needs to be placed in a broader historic, you know, historical context. And I think in this sense, the idea of the exhibition that you're mounting is significant because, uh, a lot of the things that are happening in the market because they're driven by an outside looking in interest into, into Africa uh, are basically uh, are come from a premise of the world was created yesterday, right? And they neglect the idea of tradition, they neglect the idea of the longevity of, you know, the the basically the eternity of art on the continent. And it's something that we really need to assert right as practitioners on the on the continent who are invested in the future of uh, art on this continent 
a future can, you know, no, none of us dropped out from the sky, all of us have roots. And the current moment seems to want to, like the market is not interested in the roots. The market is not interested in perpetuity. The market is a fairly speculative one. And we need to assert our right to the history and and honor, honor the history. So I think it's really important, the fact that this exhibition takes place, you know, in a broader, you know, historical perspective rather than the, the here and now, right? So that's that's one thing. The second thing I would like to, I guess, raise is the fact that the idea, you know, the idea of figuration, and you you have alluded to it in the past, is also one kind of really look is a I would like to say is 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 an irrelevancy. An irrelevancy is that we speak about art. We you know, like in my personal practice, I speak about there's either good art or bad art. It doesn't matter what it is. And also, but in a cultural context, the idea of figuration is also um, is also Eurocentric, I would argue, right? The, the concept of depiction is treated differently in different cultures. Um, I grew up in Australia where uh, 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 indigenous people have, have an incredible approach to uh, depiction, which is very much around storytelling and map making. Uh, but which is perceived to an outside gaze as, as being either figurative or very abstract, but neither is the case. Uh, it is, it's about speaking to a tradition that you simply don't understand or have failed to engage with. And I believe that this is also frequently the case uh, with African contemporary art or with African art as where just because you from the outside don't understand the nature and the symbolism, you you choose to read it in the way that is convenient or interpretable to you, and which has very little, and you talk about it, and by you, I don't mean you, Lee, I just mean- uh, No, I know, don't worry. <laughs> the outside, you. And and so, uh, so for instance, you know, uh, someone like uh, uh, Eleanor Chui, is um is you know to me as a as a you know primarily a you know european culturally european person at the at the outside of my you know at the outside would appear to be uh, an abstract person but then learning more about you know the culture and you know the kenti cloth and the history i you know i would now read read the work as something that is I would call more about narrative abstraction, right? The idea of storytelling through certain symbols, through certain uses of media and, and pattern that is, that is very different. So there is no separation in my view uh, of, uh, you know, the duality or the binary that is created is a very kind of westernized, you know, philosophically Western binary that is just not really relevant and not very special in, in contemporary non-African art either. But I think in particular, it is a misinterpretation to read work as figurative or non-figurative in my view. So with this in mind, I would actually like to speak a little bit more and also- Yes, and please also, tell us about do, EPI. <laughs> yeah, will do. So for those of you who are, who are sort of just tuning in. Uh, Emerging Painting and Invitational is a project that was developed by the African Art Galleries Association uh, in, and was launched in Harare in 2019 as a hybrid project that would operate as, you know, at the same time as a, as a prize, as a Pan-African Emerging Painting Prize, uh, which would operate as a prize, as an exhibition, as an opportunity to gather, uh, people interested in the work and who support the work, but also with the view to supporting painting on the continent. Uh, why? Because painting is, is, is a really powerful storytelling medium. Painting is really, really difficult. And, uh, and, and both because it requires uh, skill and access to materials and it's, it's quite expensive. And, and because we, you know, we believed we, we wanted as an association and, as you know, as a number of people who are really interested in integrity 
of art on the continent wanted to show uh, the, the profound, you know, richness and diversity of practices that are coming out from different countries uh, and different artists on the continent, rather than the idea of the uniformity that we were seeing or kind of the Western facing uniformity that we we're seeing as gallerists, uh, you, know, oh, you know, taking part in, oh, uh, in art fairs taking place outside the continent. And so there was this idea that art should be seen in context, art should be seen on the continent, and we, we wanted to bring people to the continent to see the art in context. Um, unfortunately, or uh, uh, I suppose uh, the COVID and uh, rest COVID, you know, and travel restrictions interfered in 2020 and 2021, and they're sort of still with us. Um, and we had to convert the project uh, to an online event, which again led us to do something hybrid in collaboration with Strauss, who have been a sponsor of uh, the first prize since the inception, and we're extremely, you know, grateful for the support. And um, Strauss proposed, uh, again, a hybrid project at a time when young artists really all over the continent really needed the help. And uh, especially because if you're an unrepresented artist to be earning a living at a time of COVID is on the continent is extraordinarily difficult. And they proposed an auction event uh, and we collaborated on, the, on an EPI auction. So it became an auction and an exhibition and an opportunity to do online projects. And again, this is, uh, there's been a new step of sort of new world hybridity uh, that brought and engage, gave us an opportunity to um, engage with more people, more international audiences, and this has been a wonderful event. So in this year's edition, we have artists from uh, eight different countries. We have artists from, so here on the screen, we have, um, oh, we, like we keep switching. Thanks, thanks, Mia. <laughs> Uh, it's me. You so just tell me when to. Sana, move. We have Sana Shamesh, uh, we have uh, Bakri Moas, and we have um, Malipona, and I'm going to mispronounce Malipona's name, which is really, which is really, and it's been, it's been. <laughs> um, where is Malipona's name? Um, we have Malipona uh, Mapozzi. Yes. Thank you, the South African in the room. And, and so, and I think in the work we have, uh, we, we have three radically different practices. I think we have an artist, you know, from North Africa, we have an artist from, I guess, East Africa, Sudan, and we have an artist from South Africa, but we also have radically different approaches to storytelling, you know, uh, Abu, ba Abu Bakri um, Moez is, uh, is you know really interested in in um, and he's from Sudan and he's really interested in nature and and the flow of water that is he's you know and so we see that and he's he's an expressionist but also you can see a lot of Sudanese tradition in uh, in his work if you do invest the time in doing so. Um, Sana is a you know <laughs> Sana is a feminist. Malipona is a, you know, is an Afrofuturist who is influenced by, I, I mean, to my view, is influenced by digital culture, right? So you have somebody who's a painter, but who's really, you know, he's who's incorporating digital, you know, digital approach to making art in her practice. So then you have other, you know, other artists. So we can switch screens. <laughs> we can switch screens, um, like Paul Wallington, and uh, Christian um, King Dusabe, uh, as well as um, uh, Samuel Muriti, um, uh, who are you know who are using who are all using uh, strong elements of figuration, but in also stylistically difference. There's the you know the the currently what we see is a more conventional style today, which is interesting, uh, which is photo derived uh, painting, and then the more traditional. A kind of approach, but with a, you know, with elements of surrealism in Paul's work. Uh, so we can switch screens. <laughs> yeah, then we have super interesting work that's the on the extreme um, left of the screen. We have Benigno Tenio, uh, who's, you know, whose work reminds me of um, 
batik, but it is in fact painting, and who's referencing, I guess, some traditional traditional figures. But I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of spirit. There's a really strong spiritual element to the work, right? You know, which is which is really mystifying, but also extremely, you know, extremely humane and and you know, just compassionate and beautiful. There's so much really beautiful stuff going on in that work. Then in the middle we have uh, Ravel Pillai's work, um, who's um, which is you know, which this work is a part of a series that is in the prize called the Birthday Party, and this is the cake, and it's actually a very uh, you know, like a very dark piece of painting, you know, how you can take an object, but then infuse it with a lot of really emotional depth and a lot of emotional content that is, you know, very, you know, only the painting can actually provide you with, you know, that kind of possibility, right? And then, uh, and then Muna is going to really be upset with me. So Muna's work, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because she was upset that uh, we did not pronounce her name properly the last time. So uh, Muna Benamani, please, I'm praying that I pronounce it properly. And she's also uh, a painter. And, and I think her work is really, really just beautifully, uh, A, beautifully painted, B, such like just wonderful use, use of color. And it's really musical. So to me, and she's a musician. And so to me, the, the musical flows in the, in the work are just really wonderful. So again, the figure is really part of a an emotional and you know almost a soundscape that she's creating with her painting. Um, next screen, you know, and here we have wow. <laughs> so, so we have um, so we have on the left we have Nadnael. Uh, Abashir, who is an Ethiopian painter. Again, he's, you know, he would also describe himself as a narrative abstractionist, I would believe, that, that the work that he's making is really more about telling storytelling rather than just, you know, what one would call abs abstraction, where uh, which comes from, uh, you know, modernist vocabulary where we're discussing expression. Abstraction is an expression of kind of an inner world. This is This is work that doesn't appear to be referencing something specific, but is very definitely about storytelling. And similarly, um, you know, Joyce Jazz in the middle is um, somebody who is, um, who is also very much focused on, you know, I guess it, on the history of painting uh, in a way, because we can pick up lots of different things in her work uh, that are both to me, our history of, um, you know, of Western painting in particular, but also extremely playful elements that are just, you know, very, very deeply personal. And they can, you know, and they will have, and they do have, um, uh, you know, I guess figurative elements, but at the same time, they're very much, you know, very much a personal interpretation of of something, something, you know, and I think something, something is is something to be reckoned with. And then finally, on the right, we have Kotsa Matsuneng, right? Again, I'm mispronouncing the name desperately, um, and I apologize. But again, somebody who I don't believe can honestly be read as an abstractionist. Again, he's a he's a storyteller. These works are. Land, you know, are both landscapes, the futurescapes, and they they exist in the end. It's somebody who's building his own universes and expects us to follow him into that line. And you know, and he's building storytelling. And I think really, really amazing work. And I encourage everyone to check out and to support the the sale. And I think I think Mia will, you know, will post the auction link. The auction, the all of these works can be visible online on the auction link, as well as the Emerging Painting Invitational website where you can learn more about the artists and, um, and you know, see their bios and watch their video introductions. Okay. With, uh, but then go back to the auction website and register for the auction. They're all really wonderful guys to support. We have, is this the final screen? Yes. <laughs> I think, yes. So we've got Boemo Diali, who's like, a you know, one of my favorite young discoveries, you know, last year, um, fantastic, you know, you know, fantastically passionate young, uh, young artist. Uh, 
and um, <laughs> who's, you know, what am I, what am I going to say? You know, I think, I think the work speaks for itself, to be honest. I, this is the point at which, you know, who wants, who wants us to just feel passionate with her, right? And uh, she's uh, uh, very much, you know, about the figure as an action point, right? I think that's all, I think that's, that's what you can say about uh, Boemo's work. I think, it's, I think it's wonderful. I own a piece. <laughs> We've got in the middle, um, we have uh, Solomon Kifle's work, and I would call him uh, a surrealist, to be honest. I think, you know, this is because, uh, and and again, this is this is the wonderful thing. This is why a painting prize is such a you know, and why painting is so important um, because it enables you to imagine worlds and and engage with different elements of the universe and and create our own you know build universes in the way that you feel is important and to communicate messages in the most cogent way that makes sense to you, right? And they don't have to you know, they don't have to fit in with anyone else's preconception. And um, and last but not least, you know, to use a cliche, um, we've got Isaac Yurumve from Rwanda, who's, again, you know, he's, uh, who's uh, also, he's, he was, I mean, for me, the interesting, and I pointed that out last night, is that he also comes from Rwanda, but his work is so radically different to Christian uh, King Jusabe's work, and 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 to me that just brings into context the whole idea of generalization. You know, when people speak about African contemporary, you know, I will I will just and I think I will finish off because um to round off um uh, is I remember going to one fifty four in uh, uh, art fair in London in uh, twenty thirteen, and I had a, a London collector uh uh a white person, shall we say, say to come into the booth and say, you know, like I'm walking around and to me, everything looks the same. Why does all African art look the same? And, and to my mind, this was a comment from somebody who is actively blind. But I sometimes think that, uh, you know, when we look with, with our minds and not our eyes and not our hearts, we we fail to register and so i think the way to so so some of the reason you know an epi and the diversity of works in epi is a way of trying to you know i guess force people to look with their eyes in fact force people to suspend judgment force people to suspend preconceptions and cliches and and really and try to engage right so i think that would be my closing statement that ultimately thanks let's so look much Valerie it's difficult to highlight 16 finalists in one shot in 10 minutes well done you did a fantastic job and just to remind everybody to register on Strauss's website and also that the winner of the uh, prize will be announced at our opening event um, on the 16th of February which I'm really looking forward to and thank you. I will be back with you in a moment. I'm going to go to end off. I want to go back um, a little bit to the beginning slide. Just hang on one minute. I want to go back here. And I'm going to go back in alphabetical order. So Ayobola, I'm going to pick on you first, if you don't mind, because uh, you were at the beginning. Um, I thought it might be a good idea to end with this final comment from each of you about what your response is to this title of the panel. Um, where to from here with contemporary African art or figurative contemporary African art? And it's a question I'm sure you now realize if you've been watching from the beginning, it's a question that I have been um, challenging in a way through the, the, the whole uh, webinar as well as in the way we're exhibiting. So um, Ayabola, can you please tell us what you think about this statement or question? Um, I think it's an interesting question, but as a mental exercise, more than anything else, um, this might be the most artisty thing I've ever said, but figurative contemporary African art, it will go where it needs to go. Uh, I feel like the question 
even asking the question is predicated on the idea that that it's something foreign you know that like that it's something new it's like asking okay where's bitcoin going next because we just <laughs> literally just heard of it you know it's it's a part of my, my lineage it will for me it will pass on to whoever it needs to pass on to in whatever form makes sense to them drawing on what they come from um i really exactly. can't think of a better answer than that it will go away no that's a fantastic answer that was i was hoping to get one response like that at least helen <laughs> what is your reflection um yeah i, I agree with ayobola that uh it's this idea of it being this new thing is i mean we have paintings in dombo shower here that are you know hundreds of years old so um uh yeah, I think it's more it's more of a question that has to do with identity politics than it has to do with art. Um, and it seems to me that, well, I mean, just from what I've seen, it seems to me that artists that are more interested in identity politics are diaspora artists. Um, and I mean, African artists working on the continent have, I don't know, much more complex questions. Than, yes. than that so I, yeah I, I don't really I think it's really sorry for interrupting but I do think it's really interesting that you point out a historical context of figuration on on the cave walls and um other area in Zimbabwe that shows that it's not a foreign um theme the figure within the continent. It's very historical and it's very nuanced and it's very interesting to explore as a subject. Um, yeah, but so, those, those painting, I mean, I think it's not really about, about figuration. Um, no, no, not at all, but it is figure. Yeah, that's arguable, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Move on to the next, <laughs> yeah. Um, Teresa. Um, I I think for me, I'm I'm actually I think the question for me rather is like where do we see African art or maybe not African art but the African art industry in the next few years, uh, and I'm very excited. Um, I think I have a little sister. She I think she identifies as an artist. I don't even know what that means. Uh, but then she, uh, they are in her generation. Uh, they are very much influenced not only by. Um, African history and African artists, but they are influenced by artists all over the world and cultures all over the world. She's obsessed with um, Korean culture. And uh, I wonder what um, infinities and connections she'll make through that uh, as an African, you know, a young African girl that's interested in Korean culture. So for me, I'm, for me, I, I don't know where it's going, but I'm very excited to see where it will go. I agree. I think it's an open ended question in many ways, and that's probably why I chose it as the the title of this webinar. It just showing the three of you as artists and how differently you take um, the theme and the way you're individually working with art um, and how it can be unpacked and explored is extraordinary. And I'm so looking forward to what you have next to offer us, all three of you. So thank you so much to the artists. Valerie, we have one minute um, for you to reflect on the question, but I think you did cover it um, very well in your responses um, before you went into EPI. Do you have anything to add? Oh, well, I'm with everyone. Oh, well, I think the future is African. And I think the future for African art is, is uh, agency, right? So I think that's the, the word is agency. And uh, as somebody who engages with the market, I think that's what that if we speak with authority, it is on our own terms. And it's whether whether it's if you go, you know, and I think it's wonderful that ter what Teresa said about her sister wanting to engage globally. And so she can and she should. It's it's whatever you want it to be. You know, you get to say who you are, you know, and you get to speak how you want to speak, and not because somebody else wants you. And that agency is the 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 that's what my hope is. Agency. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you very much. And thanks to all our panelists. We have run out of time. I am going to be sneaky if that's okay, Mia, and open up. Is there any questions from our audience? I see so many of you have stayed till the end. It's been a wonderful support to see so many numbers. Um, does anyone have a burning question for any of the panelists? Oh, we've been, we've been exhausted. <laughs> we have spoken a lot. I think. I think we'll end it here then. I don't see any questions. Thank you again to our panelists. Please join us for the exhibition next week and come discuss um, and debate and challenge some of the things that we've done because that's what we want to do. We want to open up, we want to unpack and we want to give historical context to the continent's production. Thank you yes. very much for having us today. And thank you, everybody. Just thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.